The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. 30 years ago, a Bronx newspaper was firebombed, apparently over an editorial that defended a local bookstore's right to sell Salman Rushdie's satanic verses, which had elicited a fatwa by the Ayatollah in Iran. Of course, I'm referring to the firebombing of the Riverdale Press on February 28, 1989. While there is never a wrong time to discuss freedom of the press and the right to publish materials that are objectionable to some, in this day and age when journalists and the press are vilified repeatedly and the lines between reporting facts and fiction are increasingly difficult to identify, this incident, which was certainly devastating at the time, is as relevant today as ever. And who better to add 30 years perspective to that terrible February day and provide some analysis into the state of Bronx media and all reporting for that matter than the Pulitzer Prize winning former co-publisher of the Riverdale Press, Bernard Stein. Nice to have you with us. Nice to be with you, Gary. And also joining us on the phone is Buddy's brother, also a former co-publisher of the paper. He was a general manager. Buddy was the editor. Uh, nice to talk to Richie Stein. How are you, Richard? Very good, Gary. I hope good. you're doing well. Hi, buddy. <laughs> Hi, Rich. I don't have to introduce the guests to each other. They apparently know each other. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's start uh, with you, um, buddy, about um, the editorial you wrote. Um, uh, the editorial was The Tyrant and His Chains. Correct. Um, what w people can read it, actually, in the current edition of the Riverdale Press. It's uh, written, it's uh, reprinted in there. Um, just... What, what were you thinking about? What were your concerns, and why did you put it out? Well, first of all, it was one of those weeks where I didn't know what I was going to write about. You've had weeks like that, maybe? I think we all know about that. Sometimes we don't and, have a guest. <laughs> uh, sure enough, the uh, author, Salman Rushdie, had his life threatened by this communique from the ruler of Iran and went underground. And three days after that, uh, the big chain bookstores, Walden, Barnes & Noble, and Dalton, pulled the book off their shelves. And that gave me something to think about. We had, at that time, an independent bookstore in Riverdale, the only bookstore in all of the Bronx. And I called up the proprietor and asked her what she was doing, and she said, we're scared to death, but we're going to sell the book. And that gave me a, first of all, I thought that was wonderful, and second, uh, it gave me a local perspective, a local hook for an editorial. On a very large story. On a very large story, but, but something local and, and important to write about. Did you it. think that putting out The Tyrant and His Chains was going to make the Riverdale Press a target? Now, I do want to mention to you that um, you did mention, actually, in, in, the, in the editorial, uh, terrorists may reason, think what a bomb in an uncompliant bookstore would do. So it had occurred to you that, you know, this whole activity might have inspired the wrong thing even in the bookstore. Did you think the paper would be No, I think, you, I think actually you misread what I wrote. Oh, yeah? Because Sorry. what I meant was, um, if they succeed as they seem to have done in making threats that got the big bookstore chains to pull the book off the shelf, then... What are they going to conclude from that? Well, maybe we can threaten bookstores and make them put something on the shelf that we want to see published. Maybe they can, uh, but as far as the editorial and the newspaper were concerned, I, had, I thought it was motherhood and apple pie. I never in a million years would have thought that it would have brought the destruction of this building that my parents had been 
so proud to, to purchase. Um, and when I was on my way down to the office, having been notified at five in the morning that the building was on fire, and then had a call from Richie saying we've been bombed, I racked my brains trying to figure out what could have been it, the it, cause. It didn't even occur to you at that time. Until I got to the office and a lieutenant from the fire department said, written anything about Salman Rushdie lately? And I, I wonder why the uh, fire department would have thought that. I guess they were they, they read the Riverdale Press. Oh, <laughs> there, there you go, um, Richie. Let's um, talk to you a little bit now. You were the first one down there. You want to just recount that fateful morning, and, and um, <laughs> uh, you know, and and I will give uh, Michael Hinman and the uh, other reporters at the press, uh, you know, some credit because they did document it. But in your own words, just how do you remember it, and uh, you know, what was well, it like? I, I call it the the night of my. Uh, nuclear explosion actually because uh, it had already been a bad night. I, my, my son had a science project in which he was had built a, a uh, model of a, uh, uh, a hydrogen atom and I had gone down to uh, Canal Street with him to get parts for this thing to get a motor and, and a battery pack and he put it together at the last minute and the whole family went to bed and I uh, foolishly thought, I have to see this thing in action, and I flipped the switch to see the electron fly around the, uh, the, the, the nucleus of this atom, and it began spinning faster and faster and faster until it blew apart in my kitchen. And, all <laughs> and that the was pieces, that's the night before? This is, this is the night before. This is, uh, you know... <laughs> that is crazy. And, and so, uh, I, I, you know, I was, I was horrified, and I, and I spent the rest of the night putting it back together for him, hoping that he wouldn't notice that I had blown it apart and, and rewiring the battery pack so that it wouldn't go around so fast and blow apart and, and, and hit all the kids in his classroom the next day. Yeah, so that I that is crazy. I have to tell you, that is crazy. And if somebody made a movie about this, <laughs> and, and they would say, well, that's kind of like, you know, a device used by a producer to foreshadow an event. But, <laughs> right. but that actually had a, happened. That's, it it that's actually crazy. happened. And then, then I, I, I finally got to bed, and I, you know, at 3.30 in the morning, I'm tossing and turning. i trying to, you know, calm myself and, and go to bed. And, and the phone rang. And it was the, uh, the alarm company telling us that the fire alarm had gone off. It was a relatively new alarm, and we'd had a lot of false alarms. And I thought this was just another false alarm. Wow. But it was a fire alarm. It was, you know, the false alarms before had been burglar alarms. Right. My mom apparently got the same call, and she called me a couple of minutes later, and she would not let me go back to sleep. She just said, you've got to get down there. It's a fire alarm. You've got to check it out. Uh, and I went down there, and I got there almost simultaneously with Gretchen McHugh, who was our photo editor at the time. She had been alerted by a friend um, in the fire department, uh, and he had called her and said, hey, your office is on fire. And she got down My there goodness. and documented um, right around the same so time. So do, you, do you have, I mean, obviously the, the horror of anybody who's got a fire in their home or their business or anything like that, I mean, you, you can't imagine, but... Yeah, uh, did did you think faster than your brother and say, "Gee, I guess Buddy uh, wrote something that upset some people"? Or Never it even occurred to me. Wow. Never even occurred to me. I didn't That's know what could have caused it. Uh, usually, you think, uh, "Oh, you know." Uh, then, then, very shortly, uh, you know, after Buddy arrived, which wasn't long after I did, uh, and he talked to the fire department. Uh, what was going through my mind was, you know, this was kind of a minor news event, that this was something I was going to hear on uh, news talk radio, uh, you know, something like that. Just and that, not you know, on, on TV 30 years later, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I never expected that it would be the kind of media so, firestorm that it became. And, and later on, I, I, I was at a party a few weeks later, and, and, and somebody uh, had just come back from China. And right around the same time, uh, was the the, the whole uh, uh, dust up at Tiananmen Square, and he had been in Beijing when that happened. And I said, "Wow, you were really the witness to major news." And uh, he stunned me by saying, "Yeah, what about well, you? <laughs> what about you?" I said, "Well, how did you know about me?" He said, "Oh, it was on the news in Beijing." Wow. Uh, so, uh, well, let, let me um, uh, ask Buddy this question then, and, and just for a little historical perspective. I, you know, it's hard to remember everything. Mm. You know, I was not as involved in Bronx media as I am now. 
Um, was this the first uh, real terrorist event almost that foreshadowed what ultimately, you know, the two bombings at the World Trade Center? I don't recall that kind of terrorism uh, in, in New York, no, certainly. It, it was the then. first. It was as the first. As far as I know, it was the first. Incredible. And it drew, you know, Richie said there was, all of a sudden, the whole New York press corps, especially the TV press corps, uh, was in front of our office. Um, a helicopter comes down and lands in Van Cortlandt Park, and out comes the mayor, Ed Koch. Uh -huh. um, the Joint Terrorism Task Force shows up, uh, headed by an FBI agent, and... Um, all of a sudden, we are the center of focus of a great deal of attention. Do, you, do any regrets? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you don't regret writing it. You stand oh. firm to what you believe oh, in. No. I'm sure. No, of course no. not. Um, and I guess there's uh, a lot of uh, thanks that um, uh, nobody was hurt. I mean, I guess the the, the the potential, of course, is there was real potential. Both um, I hadn't realized until I read this issue of the paper. Um, because the current staff did a nice job of finding many of the reporters and staff members from back then and interviewing them, uh, that Larry Dublin, one of our reporters, said in the interview that he often on a Monday night, Tuesday was our press day, he was, if he was behind, he would sleep on a couch in the oh, So in the he could have been in the... And I always knew that Rafi Sugarman, who was the sports editor, um, often stayed very late at night not that he slept there, but that he would be working there, could be working there at 4 or 5 in the morning. Um, and so, thank goodness, neither yeah, of them neither was there. there. Yeah, uh, and the, the building it, itself was between a gas station and a six-story apartment building. Wow. And, and God forbid the, the uh, you know, the, 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 the flames somehow made it to the gas station and set off. Uh, the gasoline. I, the I was not been. aware, also, uh, like Buddy, that w until I read this edition of the paper, that the people, uh, it never occurred to me that the, the, the people responsible for it never had been caught. Now, I'm going to, we'll start with you, Richie, and then I'll let Buddy have the final word on it. Uh, in my introduction, I said apparently, because if it were never caught and it was never confirmed that this is what caused it, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I guess the journalistic integrity of me said, apparently, when Buddy saw my script, he said he didn't agree. So we'll start with you, Richie, and then we'll give Buddy the final word. Do you think apparently is appropriate, or are you without a doubt, uh, uh, you know, confirmed that this editorial is what caused that bombing? Well, there was, uh, the, the FBI ran down so many other leads and kept coming back to this. Uh, I also have uh, a, a totally unconfirmed suspicion that perhaps the bombers in the first World Trade Center bombing, maybe they had some connection because I think that they had a Yonkers connection and, um, you know, that I was, I was never able to track that down. But I do think that uh, there really isn't any question. All right. Now, uh, you know, I know I'm dealing with two really good journalists here. So far, I'm standing by my apparently. Based <laughs> on what you said, I don't know if you have something Let further. me tell you, what? Gary, there is still a $50,000 reward out there. <laughs> really? I'll so, keep that in mind. Uh, anybody listening, if you want to do some investigation, uh, it could be worth $50,000 to you to track down All the right, let's see what the, the editor The story says. that appeared in the press the day after the bombing hedged. Uh, it that noted... You wrote it or somebody else wrote Tom it? Tom Watson and I wrote it. Okay. And we noted that there had been a prank of some sort at Horace Mann's school where a burning car had been shoved down the hill towards the school, and this had happened, and we weren't certain. Then the FBI played a tape recording for me of the 911 call that was made at the moment of the bombing. And the call said something like, uh, you know the newspaper that was bombed? We do this because of the book. We're going to do more bombings. Sorry about that. Something like that. Something pretty to close to that. That's a pretty close paraphrase. In an accent that the FBI experts said was Pakistani. Mm -hmm. uh, when I heard that tape recording, the hair on the back of my neck went up. Because mm -hmm. that confirmed that, that, that it was It this. was that that confirmed that, that, to me, that in fact we were bombed because of that editorial. 
Uh, I, I want to move the dialogue a little bit, and I know we have a, an excerpt from the original editorial, which was published on February 23rd. Um, 28th. No, 28th was the bombing. The editorial was published prior, right? You're right. On the 23rd. No, the, no, the editorial was written prior, but it appeared in oh, um, and the, the uh, issue of the issue dated February 28th. Ah, there you go. Okay. It was written on the 23rd. But anyway, um, and, and folks, if they want to put those words up on the screen. The power, this is what your words, um, Buddy Stein, the powers of reason and imagination are indeed the underpinnings of our civil, civilization. To suppress a book or punish an idea is to express contempt for the people who read the book or consider the idea. Um, right now in America, we, ha we have a, um, you know, a, 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 the media is a, a, mm -hmm. at, um, a, is a target. Yep. Uh, there's no question about it. And, and I'll just use a very simple thing. Apparently the president um, went on TV or tweeted whatever uh, saying that, you know, somebody ought to rope SNL in, which of course sat satirizes mm -hmm. the president, I think, pretty effectively um, and humorously. And he said they should be roped in. Um, this is antithetical to certainly the, the foundation of this particular editorial. Of course it is. And in the op-ed piece that I wrote for this issue, uh, I made some reference to uh, how things are now. And I noted that when we were bombed, George H.W. Bush condemned the bombing from the White House. And I said, can you imagine the occupant of the Oval Office today uttering those same words? Bush said that, you know, freedom of speech was fundamental to uh, our democracy, freedom of press was fundamental to our democracy, and that this act was intolerable. And I cannot imagine our current president saying something like that. Uh, if if a, um, um, a media had been bombed, well, listen, we had a um, uh, an American journalist murdered, brutally murdered uh, in by you know, Absolutely. Saudi Arabia, by the prince in Saudi Arabia. He won't even acknowledge that. Uh, Richie, just your thoughts, um, and now you still are somewhat active in the paper. Your thoughts about... Um, the climate now for uh, printing. If somebody, uh, I'm gonna, I, we'll start again with Richie and then we'll add Buddy. If somebody would suggest an editorial like this that attacked something like this, uh, you would support the, uh, the right to publish it? Well, first I've got to say, isn't Buddy a wonderful writer? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, and I, I, well, truth be told, when I, when I read this, I was sitting with my wife and I said to her, I said, boy, do we miss Buddy Stein's writing. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, the answer to that is definitively yes. The, the people so, at the Pulitzer yeah, no, Prize well, agree, too. Do, nobody could do it as well as Buddy, but I certainly would support it. Uh, and, you know, what was, what, what was running through my mind, uh, and I don't think I'm the first to, to, to have this connection, uh, as you were reading Buddy's editorial, was, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 what was said about Thomas, where will no one rid me of this troublesome priest? And, and I feel as though this is the kind of thing that uh, uh, Donald Trump is saying, and that when, when it's, it's truly scary, I think, to be a reporter at a, uh, at a, at a Donald Trump rally and, have, and, and be, be uh, pointed out from the podium uh, to, to the mob uh, that there goes a CNN reporter and, 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 and uh, uh, have, to have him taunted well, I, I mean, I can tell you I have a very close relative who does that on a regular basis, and he has told me it is very frightening. And he said, you know, I'm just standing there doing my job. You know, he said, I'm not attacking anybody. I'm not writing or doing anything other than trying to report what I see. And, um, and so I can confirm firsthand that that, is, that, that that is the case. This is a very difficult climate to be a, a reporter. But to your I question... I would say if there was no yeah. other reason to get these thugs out of the White House, that <laughs> would be a good one. Well, right? that, and that is an editorial comment from <laughs> It <story>. is. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You no, but, but you asked about, uh, you know, someone to, were to write a defense of freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of expression today. Is that something that ought to be published, something I would support? And the answer is more than ever. Mm -hmm. for exactly the reasons that uh, you're laying out. 
Let, let's talk about um, the idea and, and even the phrase fake news mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what is fake news? And, and part of, um, I, I guess, the 30 years that have passed is that this was how we all got our news, whether it had been the Riverdale Press or the New York Times or, you know, whatever, whatever your Wall Street Journal, whatever you read. And, of course, you got it off, um, you know, TV stations. Mm -hmm. Um, nowadays, media can come from anywhere. You could set up a blog that says anything on your own right now at very little cost and put out anything you want, and that could be shared or tweeted by literally millions of people. Absolutely. Um, what do you think about the term fake news? Is there fake news? It's almost like a, a, you know, a, a conflict in, in and of itself. Just give me, give me your impression of that. Well, I think we ought to ought to uh, consign that phrase to uh, the dustbin of history, first of all, uh, because it's f ideologically fraught. Uh, of course, sometimes a news outlet gets it wrong. Um, a responsible news outlet corrects those mistakes as soon as they are pointed out to them or as soon as they recognize them. Uh, but you're absolutely right about uh, the impact of the Internet and of social media. Uh, and it becomes the job of a citizen to understand where whatever set of facts they think they know, where do those come from? Right? Mm -hmm. how, does the, how does the person know who's blogging or mm -hmm. who's putting it on Facebook or, or who's or, or tweeting even, it or who's publishing it in the New York Times? Or repeating it on Facebook or something. Yeah, I mean, no. I see a lot of headlines and things that I'm like, wow, take a look at this. And then I look and it's from some independent paper or some independent source that I've never heard of before. Yeah. But here's what I want to weigh in. And, and again, Richie, you can have a shot at it after Buddy deals with it. Um, the President of the United States will stand at a press conference in front of the White House and say, CNN, I don't want to talk to you because you're fake yes. news. And the New York Times is fake yes. news. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words when I hear that because, yes, maybe there are some things that are slanted, maybe there are some things that are editorial, maybe do they do get some things wrong, but that debases all media in a way. And then, of course, he doesn't say that about his favorite well, channels. Well, it also debases the whole idea that there is such a thing as truth, and that's what's frightening. Uh, and I'll tell you a little story. I joined a group, a Facebook group, called Bronx Open Eyes on Trump because I was interested in knowing what Trump supporters, who are my neighbors, uh, and what, were thinking. And what people in the Bronx are saying. Yeah. So I, I can relate to that, by the way. Can I jump Recent, in here for a well, minute? I'm well, having a little trouble him, hearing Buddy, let but let I can him, hear you, Gary. Okay, let, let him, uh, we'll tell them that, but let him finish and then yeah. we'll... Okay, okay. let I'll me I'll repeat know. it if I have to. Okay. So somebody put up on this website, on this uh, Facebook group, um, a supposed press release from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And it was a, it made no sense. Right? It was a tweet. But just the notion of oh, supposed, let me yeah. It was a tweet. So I went to Twitter, and the Twitter account says clearly parody of Alexandria, of AOC. Parody, right? So I decided, okay, I'm going to post a comment saying this is a parody. The original poster came back and said, well, it didn't look on Twitter the way it looks. I'd done a screenshot. It didn't look on Twitter, my Twitter the way it looks on your Twitter. I said, well, I, I, I simple don't know enough, what that means. Simple enough, go to Twitter and look. Yeah. And he came back and said, no, it's definitely her. So people, the scary thing is when people become impervious to correction or to, to, to facts. Understanding that, yeah. We um, all have our own facts now. Right. Uh, uh, Richie, um, you're, uh, I don't know if you heard what he said, but he was just talking about trying to interpret what's out there, and then how do you determine I understand. I just yeah. wanted to say that Buddy will be leading a seminar on May 19th ah. uh, at a neighborhood university hosted by Riverdale Neighborhood House. So if people want to hear a more extended version of what he's saying, uh, that would be a great chance to hear it and to uh, uh, 
go to the neighborhood houses website in a few days when they put up the information about that, it. That 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 is that is good to know, but he won't need to do that because we're just going to extend this program to another hour and get, <laughs> better, <laughs> and get it all done here. Okay. Um, so so uh, and and buddy, you you're still involved, of course, and, and Richie too. Um, uh, where where are we at in the Bronx? I mean, I can list the newspapers we have. We have the Riverdale Press, we have the Norwood News, we have the Mont Haven Herald. Uh, we have the Hunts Point Express. Both of those come out of uh, mm -hmm. graduate programs. And we have the Bronx, Bronx Times. Times. Um, there's This is the Bronx. There's News 12. There's 1.3 million people here. It seems, uh, my feeling is, and BronxNet, of course, um, we're, we're, yeah. we're not being served. Welcome to the Bronx. Another... Welcome to the Bronx. We're, we're not being served, is, is how I, I feel. It, that there's just, there's so many people, and, and there is a real glut of real reporting in the Bronx. A real, yeah, dearth of, of a, a real dearth of <laughs> dearth of reporting. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, it's true. Buddy, can I take this one? Yeah, all right, go ahead, Richie. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to say, first of all, obviously there are other media that are cropping up. Uh, I, you know, there's a Riverdale uh, 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 Facebook page, and there are. Uh, so there are other. Well, there are numerous places. Bronx Facebook pages. We know that. Yeah, I yeah. was talking about you have a, you have a a, uh, a website. If I can plug that. Sure. Um, uh, which has begun to fill the gap. Also, uh, you know, there is new ownership for the Bronx Times reporter. I don't know right. what's going to be happening with that, but that may, may uh, uh, you know, revitalize uh, those papers. But, but, you know, the one thing I want to say about that is that, yes, there are Facebook pages and there are all that, but are they credible sources? And Buddy was talking about a Facebook page that was cre almost created to be slanted, and then if people take that as as news as mm. the truth, that's where the danger becomes. I, I well, guess you know, there was a uh, tabloid paper in Riverdale for a while, and a lot of people uh, used to complain to me that that was not a uh, a credible source. All right, we got uh, we got about a minute, Richie. You're going to get this first. W um, if there was something that was highly objectionable, whether it be a racist book or a racist editorial. Um, you would support its right to print? Yes. And that comes right from a, uh, an old Riverdalian, Fred Fredley. <laughs> oh, uh, that's right. Who wrote a book called Minnesota Rag about just that. Your thoughts on something like that? Yeah, our policy when I was editor of the Riverdale Press was to publish every letter that we got so long as I could authenticate its authorship. We some, published some racist, not so kind for you. <laughs> racist, homophobic, anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic because my feeling was then and remains that when you're confronted with hate speech or horrid speech, you have an obligation, you the reader, you the, the audience have an obligation to respond to it. And that in a paradoxical way, that kind of speech becomes a positive We're thing. gonna wrap it up and I'm gonna say respond to it peacefully so we don't have to go through what we went through 30 years, <laughs> what you went, we all went through really 30 years ago. Uh, Buddy Stein, thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Gary. you for your great work. And uh, Richie Stein, thank you for your great work. And uh, hopefully all these editorials and all these responses will then be in print and not <laughs> in things like this. We appreciate it. All right, they're telling me we got to get out of here. If you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, then send us an email at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You can tweet us at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page. We thank our producer, Helen Greenberg, our directors, William Guzman and Nick Marrero. Next week, we will do a little nostalgia. We'll get into a new book about Freedom Land. And then on the 25th, much more serious, Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. will be joining us here in the studio. Good night.